Hello everyone, welcome to the Spatial Variability Lecture Series Part 1 which is about using probabilistic analysis for a slope stability. My name is Sina Javan Khoshtel, I'm a geomechanics specialist at Drug Science. My colleague Bridget Kami and I are going to present in this lecture. A special lecture series uh, is a three-part series. In this video, we we'll start with probabilistic analysis for slopes, and then we will talk about the introduction to spatial variability for slopes in our next lecture, and spatial variability in a slide 2, 2018, in the last lecture. In this webinar, we will start by answering a basic question, uh, which is why do we need probabilistic analysis? Then we will talk about probabilistic slope stability analysis in slide 2 and a few examples in slide 2 at the end. Okay, why probabilistic analysis? Let's first talk about deterministic factor of safety for design. Most of geotechnical engineers are familiar with deterministic factor of safety and uh, also available design charts to find this factor of safety. For example, this chart is a revised version of uh, Taylor's chart for cohesive frictional soil slopes. In these charts, the input parameters are soil properties and the geometry of a slope, and the output parameters are deterministic factor of safety and the failure mechanism, as you can see here. However, deterministic factor of safety is not enough for design because it is unable to account for uncertainties in soil properties and loads. What are these uncertainties that make design with factor of safety insufficient? These uncertainties include inherent spatial variability of soil properties, a scarcity of representative data, changing environmental conditions, unexpected failure mechanisms, model uncertainty, and human error in design and construction. Now how to consider these uncertainties? By implementation of probabilistic analysis, we can consider these uncertainties, which means that uh, we evaluate the uncertainties influence on the likelihood of satisfactory performance for an engineering system. And this implementation helps to quantify uncertainties and systematically incorporate them into the design process. So, probabilistic analysis is very important for design purposes, but why there is a reluctance in adopting probabilistic analysis? There are different reasons. The first reason is engineers' training in probabilistic theory often limited to basic information during their early years of education. The second reason is engineers are more comfortable with deterministic analysis compared to the probabilistic analysis. Also, common, uh, there is a common misconception that it's, uh, this probabilistic analysis requires significantly more data, time, and effort that we are going to show you in this lecture that it is not going to be the case. The other reason is uh, commercial software packages were not able to carry out probabilistic analysis in a correct way for the geotechnical engineers. But now there are packages, including a slide to 2018, that they are able to consider uh, probabilistic analysis, a spatial variability specifically uh, for design purposes. And at the end, uh, Probabilistic analysis is not a replacement, a replacement for deterministic analysis. They have to be together, which means that we have to have probability of failure and factor of safety both for design purposes. Now how to show the level of uncertainty in soil properties. We use coefficient of variation or COV, which is defined as the standard deviation divided by the mean value. There are a lot of studies in literature that they present data for the coefficient of variation of different soil parameters. This example is one of them. As you can see, we have different soil properties and soil types uh, with their mean and coefficient of variation. For example, if you look at this table, you can see that uh, for the 
shear strength of the soil, the coefficient of variation is between 10 to 55 percent. 10 percent is a small number, but 55 percent is a very large number, and factor of safety cannot consider this level of uncertainty for the design purposes. Here is another example to show the importance of probabilistic analysis. Uh, we have two distribution curves of factor of safety, as you can see for a slope A and a slope B. First, we, let's define the probability of failure. Probability of failure is defined as the area under the distribution curve of the factor of safety for the factors of safety of less than one. As you can see here, we have light gray for a slope A and we have dark gray for a slope B. As you can see in this figure, a slope A has higher mean value of factor of safety, which is 1.7. And a slope B has a mean factor of safety of 1.5. So because uh, a slope A has higher factor of safety, we expect that this uh, slope uh, is safer. But if we look at the area, which means the probability of failure, you can uh, see that this area is much larger for a slope A compared to a slope the reason for that is, as you can see here again, the coefficient of variation for a slope A is 0.3. And this coefficient of variation is 0.15 for a slope B. So a slope A, because it has a higher coefficient of variation, it has a higher probability of failure. And even though we assume that uh, based on the factor of safety, a slope A is safer, it is not here. And a slope B is safer. This figure shows how deterministic and probabilistic analysis are carried out. In deterministic analysis, only one value of soil property is assigned to the entire slope and then factor of safety is calculated. In the probabilistic analysis, we have several simulations. In each simulation, one value is taken from the distribution curve of the soil parameters and uh, is assigned to the entire slope. For each simulation, we calculate factor of safety using limit equilibrium method or any other methods. And probability of failure is defined at the end of the simulation as the number of simulations with factor of safety of less than one divided by the total number of simulations. Now let's talk about probabilistic analysis in slide two. First, assume the user has defined the geometry and material properties for the deterministic analysis. Here is the uh, procedure to carry out probabilistic analysis in slide 2. First, assume the user has defined the geometry and material properties for the deterministic analysis. Now, to carry out probabilistic analysis, the first step is to define our random variables and then assign probability distribution to them. For example, in this figure, we defined uh, cohesion and friction angle as our random variables. First, we need to define their distribution type and then uh, the statistical properties of uh, each distribution. If we have the mean and standard deviation of our random variables, relative mean and relative max define the bound of distribution as a lower bound is gonna be mean minus relative mean and upper bound is gonna be mean plus relative max. Now let's talk about these statistical properties. First, distribution types. We have two common types of distributions in the slides uh, to software, normal and log normal distributions. Normal distribution is widely used and it is symmetrical, while log normal distribution is a positively skewed distribution with large spike near zero. For the probabilistic analysis of geotechnical problems, it is recommended to use log normal distribution because soil properties are always positive and log normal distribution only gives positive values. There are other distribution types in a slide, uh, such as exponential, beta, gamma, triangular, and uniform distributions. 
If user knows the distribution type, any of these distributions can be used in the probabilistic analysis. As I mentioned, relative mean and relative max defines the bound of the distribution. If you know the bound of the distribution that you have, you can put numbers in the boxes for relative mean and relative max. If you don't know them, you can use the three sigma rule in a slide, as you can see in this figure, which puts relative mean and relative max equal to the three times the standard deviation of the parameter, as you can see in this figure that uh, when we define the normal distribution for cohesion the standard deviation is 0.1 so by clicking on this button here you get 0.3 for relative mean and relative max which are the three times as, uh, the standard deviation of the parameter and it is based on the fact that 99.70 percent of all values of a normally distributed variable fall within plus or minus three standard deviations of the average. Another application of the three sigma rule is for the case that uh, when you have a set of uh, data, for example, under and shear strength in this uh, figure, uh, you can find the standard deviation using the three sigma rule. If you have the highest and lowest conceivable values, you can calculate the standard deviation using this formula in this slide. If you don't have a set of data and you don't know the standard deviation, we provided a table in a slide to 2018, which is suggest uh, suggested COV values for different soil properties. Based on the parameters uh, that you have, you can pick a number for the range of COB values provided in this table. For example, as I mentioned before, for the underrange shear strength, the standard, the coefficient of variation in this table changes from 0.1 to 0.55. So, first we assign probability distributions to soil properties. Now we uh, generate n samples for each property. To do so, we should pick a sampling method and define number of samples required for the probabilistic analysis, as you can see here, that Latin hypercube and 1000 simulation are here. Now let's talk about them. We have two different sampling methods in slide two, Monte Carlo simulations and Latin hypercube simulation. Monte Carlo simulation is a traditional method to do probabilistic analysis. And as you can see in this figure, Latin hypercube method requires fewer samples to give accuracy similar to the Monte Carlo method and gives more dis uh, uniform distributions compared to the Monte Carlo simulation for the same number of simulations. You can see here that Latin hypercube is more uniform compared to the Monte Carlo simulation. So we recommend you to uh, save some time to use Latin hypercube simulations. One of the most important steps in the probable analysis is to define a number of simulations. You don't want to define a large number when it is not necessary or a small number when your problem requires more simulations. There are different methods of calculating number of simulations. One method is to use formulas available in literature, as you can see one of them here. These formulas are more useful when you have simple slopes without a spatial variability to just give you a number to start for the probable seek analysis, and they are not accurate. The safest way is to carry out sensitivity analysis for each example. You can start with a small number of simulation and then increase the number of simulations. When you don't see a significant change in the probability of failure, that's the number of simulations that is required for your specific example. We have an option in a slide that my colleague will talk about that later to do a sensitivity analysis and get an idea about the number of required simulations. After assigning probability distribution to properties, 
and then generating n samples for each property. Now, for each simulation, we calculate factor of safety using limit equilibrium method. For the probabilistic analysis, we recommend you to use a non-circular limit equilibrium method, especially when we have a spatial variability uh, to, give, uh, to get more accurate results. As I said, we have several simulations and in each simulation you get a factor of safety. When you uh, collect the data for factor of safety, you may have a distribution similar to the distribution that we have in this figure. This is the histogram for the factor of safety. And then we can calculate probability of failure as the number of simulations with factor of safety of less than one divided by the total number of simulations. For example, again here you can see we have 146 failure cases out of 500 samples and the ratio is going to be 0.29 or 29% for probability of failure. There are a few probabilistic design charts in literature. Javan Khoshtel and Batters 2014 provided a series of design charts that factor of safety and probability of failure can be calculated in the same chart. Similar to the deterministic design charts that I talked about, the input parameters are soil properties and the geometry of the problem to calculate factor of safety. To calculate probability of failure, there is another parameter which is the coefficient of variation of soil property. As you can see in this example here, we have friction angle of 30 degrees, a slope angle of 60 degrees, and this ratio equal to 0.2. We have two additional parameters for the probability of failure, which are coefficient of variation of cohesion equal to 0.5, and coefficient of variation of friction angle equal to 0.2. If we use this chart, we get factor of safety of 1.3 and probability of failure of 25%. We took the same example to a slide to 2018 and we carried out probabilistic analysis. From the deterministic part of the probabilistic analysis, we got the factor of safety of 1.33 and we got the probability of failure of 23.45%. As you can see here, the results are very close and uh, this shows how these design charts uh, work in literature. Now I'm going to pass the presentation to my colleague Bridget and she will continue with a few examples in a slide too. Thanks, Zina. Now that we've learned about the theory behind a probabilistic analysis, we're going to put it in practice with some examples in slide two. So the first example we're going to look at will examine the effect of a global minimum and an overall slope analysis on probability of failure. This is the interface of the slide two modeler. All I've done in this model so far is define the geometry and material properties. The geometry of this model is taken from tutorial 11 in the slide two documentation, and the material properties can be viewed from properties, define materials. This is where things like strength type are selected, uh, and the parameters, in this case, cohesion, frictional unit weight, are defined for each material, as you can see here. Let's take a look at the project settings. The project settings configures the main set of parameters of the slide two model. Um, if we click on the statistics tab here, we can turn on our probabilistic analysis option. Here we see the two sampling methods uh, and we'll stick with Latin hypercube as the better option. And we're just going to run 1000 samples in this case. Now we also have to select the analysis type, global minimum, or overall slope. So what's the difference between these? Global minimum uh, means that the deterministic critical slip surface, or the global minimum surface found from the deterministic analysis, is used for all 1,000 simulations. So in each simulation, slide 2 doesn't have to search for a new minimum surface. Uh, it uses the deterministic one and calculates fs in each simulation based on the new parameters. Overall slope means that the critical slip surface search is performed in each of these 1,000 simulations. So here we might end up with several global minimum surfaces. 
The advantage of global minimum is that it's very fast, since the search for the slip surface is only done once. And for simple geometries, the results between the two are generally the same. So global minimum is better in that case. Overall slope, however, is much more accurate, uh, especially for layered complex geometries such as this one. You can make a big difference between the results. Um, so for this case, let's stick with overall slope and click OK. You'll notice that a new menu has appeared here, the statistics menu, uh, now that we've turned on our probabilistic analysis. So let's click statistics, materials, and define our random variables. For this first material, say we want cohesion and friction angle to be random variables. So to do that, we're going to click add. We're going to select our cohesion and friction angle variables and click next. And for this uh, example, we'll follow the tutorial and stick with a normal distribution and click finish. Our two random variables have appeared in the dialog. You'll notice that the mean values are filled in already. They're pulled from the material properties dialog, which I showed you earlier. Now, say I have some data and I've calculated the standard deviation for both of these. And I know that it's two for cohesion and eight for friction. So that means that the coefficient of variation value we were talking about earlier would be two out of eight for the cohesion parameter or 0.25 in this case. But what if I don't have enough data to calculate standard deviation? Well, in that case, I can use the COV table by clicking this button here. This is a summary of COV values from literature, as Sina already talked about. So you would multiply your mean by uh, one of these values to get your standard deviation if you don't have enough data. So now we've entered our standard deviation values. Uh, we're going to use the three sigma rule button to fill in the relative min and relative max fields. So I'm going to select both parameters and click three sigma rule. So for cohesion, we've defined a normal distribution with a mean of 8 and a standard devi deviation of 2, whose minimum value can be 8 minus 6 or uh, 2. And the maximum value can be 8 plus 6 or 14. So the minimum and maximum values we will be able to sample are calculated from the mean plus minus the relative max and relative min. Now for the other materials, I had to find the random variables previously, as you can see here. So we can click OK. So with this first example, we want to study the difference between global minimum and overall slope analysis types. So we have a group on the left here. Um, let's add a child scenario to it and rename it global minimum. So we're going to click add, and we're going to right click and rename this global minimum. And in Global Min, I'm going to go to Project Settings again, go to the Statistics tab, and switch to Global Minimum Analysis tab, and click OK. So I've computed these results previously, and we can take a look at the difference now. OK, so this is the interface of the Slide 2 interpreter, where the results are viewed. I'm going to click on the Tile Windows button, to view uh, both results at the same time. And I'm also going to click on this lock zoom button up here, which means I can zoom in and out of the models at the same time. Okay. The first thing we see is this green surface, uh, which is shown in both cases. This is the deterministic slip surface, and it's always calculated. Uh, so we see the value, the factor of safety value is 1.181 here, and we can also see it from here, 1.181. Um, so the left one, the le left scenario, is the uh, overall slope analysis, and the one on the right is the global minimum analysis. So this right scenario is the global minimum analysis case, and the left is the overall slope analysis case. So like we said, with global minimum, only this global minimum surface is used in all 1,000 simulations, and that's why that's the only surface that's shown here. Uh, in the overall case, however, different global minimum surfaces might be found in the 1,000 simulations. So we see all the global minimum surfaces on the bottom. To better view this, we can turn off the materials. So if we go, uh, we have a display pane on the left here. If we go to general, 
Uh, we can turn off material colors, and now we can see all the different global minimum surfaces that were found in the 1000 simulations. And we can also see their corresponding factor of safety values from the ledge. But of course, the most important thing to note here is the probability of failure value. So the global minimum found a probability of failure of 19.5%, while the overall slope found a much higher PF of 31.1%. This showcases the importance of using overall slope in models with complex geometries such as this one. So let's see what, what kind of things we can plot in interpret. If we click on statistics histogram plot, we can plot the distribution of the cohesion values that were actually sampled for this first material. <clears throat> so we're going to click plot. And we see that it's very true to what we defined. The mean, that, which was calculated from the sampled values, is 8 the same as what we defined, and the standard deviation is about 2, the same as what we defined. I'm going to close that. And we can also plot a uh, factor of safety distribution. So we go to the same place, histogram plot, click factor of safety, and we're going to highlight values of factor of safety uh, that are less than 1. And we plot. So like we said, this orange area in the factor of safety distribution is the definition of probability of failure. So everything to the left of the factor of safety one line, that area is known as the probability of failure. Um, now we also see at the top here that it says uh, Fs less than 1, 311 points. So that means that 311 out of the 1,000 simulations had a factor of safety less than 1, or 31.1%, which is the probability of failure that we saw before, 31.1%. And the other values we see on our legend are uh, factor of safety mean. So this is the average of all of the 1,000 factor of safety calculated. So in the global minimum uh, case, for example, it was uh, 1.193, whereas in the overall slope, 1.114. One we also talked earlier about how many samples is enough samples. Well, there's a cool feature in Interpret to help us with that. If we click on the Convergence Plot button, which is here, uh, we get Plot or uh, Convergence Plot. We see this plot, which has mean factor of safety on the y-axis and number of samples on the x-axis. So what this means is, when we have two samples, uh, the y-axis is the average of our first two samples. So it might be down here. When we have 100 samples, then the y-axis shows the average factor of safety for our first 100 samples, and so on. So we can essentially say that a sufficient number of samples occurs when this line straightens out and there's no significant change in mean factor of safety with increasing samples. Now let's return to our problem. So like we discussed, this example studies the importance of using overall slope analysis for slopes with complex geometries. And here we've summarized the results, once again showing that uh, the overall slope in this case found a much higher probability of failure compared to the global mean. The next example we're going to look at is a geotextile reinforced slope, as shown here. So let's pull that up in slide two. You'll notice in the document of your pain, we have two groups defined here. Uh, well, let's just focus on this first group for now. So we'll start with the project settings. If we click on methods, we see that we're using the GLE Morgenstern Price uh, Limit Equilibrium method. This method is best suited for non-circular search, as we're going to do in this example. And we're using 50 slices, which is the default. Then we can click on statistics uh, to see we're using lab and hypercube sampling again with 2,000 samples in this case. And in this example, we're using overall slope analysis. And we can click. Uh, okay. Now let's take a look at the material properties. So we can click on the Define Materials uh, button, and we can see that the yellow is the fill, green is the blocks, and the red is the foundation. Um, the Statistics button takes us to the Material Statistics dialog, where we see that log normal distributions have been defined for each material for cohesion, friction angle, and unit rate. And we can click Cancel there. By double-clicking on the support, uh, we can also see the properties of this geotextile. 
So we have turned on our probabilistic analysis, we've defined our materials, and we've defined our distributions for the random variables. Now let's take a look at what type, what type of surface search we're we doing. So we can click on the surface options button, and we'll see that we're doing a non-circular search. In this case, we're using add or refine out of the options. And we have also checked the optimized services checkbox. If we click on settings, we see that we're using the surface altering optimization method which is a very fast and powerful optimization technique released with slide 2 2018. Uh, the effect of optimization, we'll, we'll talk about that later in the third lecture of the series. Okay, so this is our master scenario for this probabilistic analysis. Now let's take a look at the child scenarios we've defined. This first one is called with surcharge. So here we're studying the same case, but what happens if there's a surcharge on the regime model? In the second scenario, this is called with support and surcharge random. We're studying the same case, but we're saying that the load magnitude has random properties. So if we click on statistics, loads, uh, we see that the magnitude of 20 has a log normal distribution assigned to it with a standard deviation of 2. So that gives it a coefficient of variation of 0.1, which is relatively small. And then we can also double click on the support and statistics to see that the tensile strength of the geotextile also has a log normal distribution assigned to it with a coefficient of variation of 0.1 as well. Okay, so now let's take a look at the results for this first group and our th first three scenarios. Okay, so this is our first uh, master scenario where only the material properties are random and this case has a probability of failure of 10.8%. After considering surcharge in our first child scenario, we see that probability of failure goes up to 26.15%, and after considering a surcharge as random and support as random, it becomes 25.9%. Because we didn't incorporate any huge variability for these parameters, uh, there wasn't such a big difference once we made load and support ran. Okay, so what have we done in this model exactly? Let's go back to our slides. Well, we've defined a distribution for cohesion and a distribution for friction angle, and we're sampling these distributions using Latin hypercube. So say Latin hypercube samples a low value of cohesion and a low value of friction angle and plugs them into simulation one. Well, we know that low cohesion tends to correspond with high friction angle and vice versa. So this simulation is very unlikely. We don't want to consider it equally with a simulation such as this one, where low cohesion is paired with high friction angle. So how can we pair our Latin hypercube samples such that low cohesion and high friction angle go into the same simulations? That's where the idea of cross-correlation comes in. So correlation describes how two sets of data are related. In this figure, there is a positive correlation between the x and y. As x increases, y increases. In the figure on the right, there does not appear to be any relationship between the parameters. And this correlation uh, is measured using the cross-correlation coefficient rho. Rho ranges between negative 1, or a perfect negative relationship, and positive 1, or a perfect positive relationship. In this figure on the right, Cherubini has plotted cohesion and friction angle values from triaxial data and has used a simple equation to calculate the row value. We can see here that as C increases, friction angle uh, decreases, indicating a negative relationship, which is what is recommended between C and phi. Uh, meanwhile, a positive relationship is recommended between C and unit weight and phi and unit weight. So say we account for cross-correlation in our model. How does this affect uh, our data? The plot on the right shows probability of failure on the y-axis and mean factor of safety on the x-axis. So for a given mean FS value, this dotted line represents the case of not considering any type of cross-correlation, and we see we get a probability of failure for this example of about 25%. The line on top considers unrealistic cross-correlation coefficient. So that means 
we're using here positive 0 0.5 value between C and phi, negative 0 0.5 between phi and unit weight, and C and unit weight. And the line on the bottom considers realistic cross-correlation coefficients, which means negative 0.5 between C and phi and positive between the others. And the effect we see is that if we consider realistic cross-correlation coefficients, our probability of failure becomes more accurate, it goes down. So in this example, it went from 25% to 10%. Okay, so cross-correlation makes our uh, analysis more accurate. It brings probability of failure down. How do we consider cross-correlation in the example we're talking about? That's done also in the material statistics dialog using this button. Let's try that now. So we're going to go back to our slide model. So earlier we looked at only group one, the no correlation case. Now we're going to look at group two, the correlation case. So here what I've done is I've duplicated the first group and added correlation. So just to show you, if we click on the master scenario, and if we click on statistics, materials, and the correlation button, we see that no uh, cross-correlation coefficients have been defined. And this is the same for the other scenarios in our first group. In the second group, if we click on statistics, materials, and correlation, we see that cross-correlation has been defined. So between cohesion and unit weight and friction angle and unit weight, it's 0.3 for all materials. And between cohesion and friction angle, it's minus 0.3 for all materials. The other scenarios are identical to the first group, just with cross-correlation. Okay, so what effect does this have on our data? Let's take a look and interpret. So let's, let's first compare our master scenarios. Our no correlation master scenario has a probability of failure of 10.8%. With cross correlation, the master scenario, it goes down to about 6.8%. And let's also look at another one. Let's look at the random support and surcharge case. So without cross-correlation, 25.9%, and with cross-correlation, 21.8%. So we can conclude it's important to consider cross-correlation in our probabilistic analysis because it makes our probability of failure value more accurate. Another helpful feature to interpret is the scatter plot. Let's plot cohesion and friction angle for our no-correlation case. So if we click on the no-correlation master scenario, we can click on statistics, scatter plot, and pick cohesion and friction angle for the fill, and plot. So because we haven't defined a coefficient here, uh, we see that there is no trend between cohesion and friction angle. And close this, and go to the correlation case and do the same thing. This time, let's do it from the button on the toolbar. Now remember here, we defined a cross-correlation coefficient of minus 0.3 between C and phi, and we can see the general negative trend. All right. Okay, so let's look at our two master scenarios again. The top row is the no correlation case with PF of 10.8% and its factor of safety distribution is also shown to the, to the left. The bottom row is the correlation case with probability of failure of 6.8% like we talked about and again with its factor of safety distribution. If we look at the FS distributions, we see that considering cross-correlation, so this bottom one, makes our distribution a little narrower with the data closer to the mean. This is because by saying low cohesion should be paired with high friction angle, we've given some more information to the model, and so we've removed some uncertainty. This makes the distribution narrower or more precise. We also see that the orange area, or probability of failure, is smaller when considering cross-correlation, as expected when compared to the no cross-correlation case. And we see that the simulations that resulted in failure went down from 216 out of 2,000 to 135 out of 2,000. So let's take a look at our cross-correlation case here. The deterministic factor of safety of 1.3 is in the range of design, 1.325. But our probability of failure of almost 7% certainly isn't. Are we still being over-conservative? Can we be even more realistic? Well, what are we doing exactly? We've defined distributions for our random parameters, 
and we're sampling values from that distribution and assigning them to each of our simulations. So this first simulation might have a cohesion of 0.7, for example. The biggest assumption we're making when we use this method is homogeneous slopes. So we're saying that cohesion is 0.7 at x equals 0, for example, and 0.7 100 meters away, or however far that may be. Well, that's a strong assumption, but it seems easy enough to fix. Instead of assigning our distribution in this homogeneous way, let's assign the samples within each simulation as well. So let's divide our slope into cells and assign values from our distribution to each cell, like this. And if we do that, our simulations are no longer homogeneous, but instead have different arrangements of cohesion values in each simulation. So simulation one would not look like uh, this homogeneous slope with one sample, but would look like this, and so on. That's where the concept of spatial variability comes in, which we'll introduce in the second lecture video. Thank you for watching the first part of our lecture series. If you have any questions or comments, please send us an email at statistics at rockscience.com. And make sure to watch part two of the series where we discuss spatial variability. Thank you.